This is not the OCHEM class you're looking for. Hello, friends, <clears throat> and welcome back. I'm here upstairs in my room with the next installment in peptide and protein chemistry. When we were together last, uh, we spoke about the backbone of peptides and proteins, and we spoke about three important dihedral angles. And I felt like I kind of rushed through it at the same time as uh, kind of my first shot through it may not have explained the situation that clearly, so I want another shot at it. Uh, by the way, let me point out that this is a new format. I'm still getting used to it, and so if you find that uh, this is quite boring and you wish to skip through at twice the normal speed or um, to pause and catch up while drawing something, feel free to do any of that. So <clears throat> we'll begin where we ended off last time. I've shown you a segment of a peptide, and we're focusing in on three amino acids, one in orange, one in purple, and one in green. I'm going to be using this little box as a pointer because I can't find anything better to do it. The orange amino acid, we're saying, is at the I position. The purple amino acid, we're saying, is at I plus one. And the green amino acid, we're saying, is at I plus two. And each amino acid contains a nitrogen, an amide nitrogen, an alpha carbon, and a carbonyl carbon. And of course, the carbonyl carbon of the I position residue, amino acid rather, is connected via an amide bond to the amide nitrogen of the I plus one position. And uh, we were speaking about the conformations adopted about this sigma bond between orange carbonyl carbon and purple amide nitrogen, and then uh, about this sigma bond between purple amide nitrogen and purple alpha carbon, and then uh, about the bond between purple alpha carbon and purple carbonyl carbon. And it looks like I've messed up there in my drawing. So the dihedral angle about this CN bond is called omega. The dihedral angle about this N alpha bond is called phi. And the dihedral angle about this alpha carb to carbonyl carbon bond is called psi. Um, now to give you a little bit of context, I thought I would show you uh, images of that helix bundle that we went through last time. And I've captured these as still images to try to give you a sense for how these things work. I've, isol I've uh, highlighted three amino acids in orange, purple, and green, just like I did over here, orange, purple, and green. And if we zoom in, the orange amino acid occupies the I position, the purple amino acid occupies the I plus one position, and the green amino acid occupies the I plus two position. And notice that these three residues occupy sort of one turn within this alpha helix. And in the ribbon diagram, you see uh, the cartoon of the helix to sort of guide your eye in terms of where the backbone is. Um, and this particular secondary structure, as I said, is called the alpha helix. And when three alpha helices interact with each other, you have a bundle of helices or a helix bundle. So the dihedral angle omega is the angle between the bond between uh, the angle between the sigma bond, uh, uh, the alpha, orange alpha carbon to carbonyl carbon sigma bond, and uh, the all right. Let me back up and try that again. The down the bond between orange carbonyl carbon and purple amide nitrogen. Uh, as we, oops, didn't want that, as shown here with this sort of Sith eye looking down that bond. And when we look down that bond, we're going to be looking 
at the angle between these two gray lines. The first is a line between orange alpha carbon and orange carbonyl carbon, and the second is the line between purple amide nitrogen and purple alpha carbon. And last time we imagined uh, looking down that carbon nitrogen bond and uh, we expected uh, because both uh, the because the amide nitrogen is conjugated with the carbonyl carbon and the carbonyl oxygen we expect both to be sp2 hybridized trigonal planar and uh, in most cases you'd expect the most stable arrangement around that carbon nitrogen bond would be to have the two alpha carbons anti to each other and in fact, if we zoom in in this helical structure and look down the orange carbon to purple nitrogen bond, you can't see the purple nitrogen because it's in the back. Uh, what you see is that the alpha carbon to carbonyl carbon bond in the front is anti to the bond between amide nitrogen and alpha carbon in the back. In other words, that dihedral angle omega equals about 180 degrees. And that's true for most peptides and proteins. There are examples where the uh, alpha carbon in the front is eclipsed with the alpha carbon in the back. Those are called cis amide bonds, and they're relatively rare, uh, though they can be important in some structures. <clears throat> All right, so confirmations about the amide bond, that's the boring one, because it's either going to be 180 or uh, 0. And in this case, when it's 180, the alpha carbons are anti to each other. Now let's take a look at the next bond, and this is the bond between purple amide nitrogen and purple alpha carbon. And when you look down that bond with your evil Sith eyes in sort of a Newman projection, we're going to be looking for looking at the angle between this first gray line between orange carbonyl carbon and purple amide nitrogen. And then the second gray line in the back between out purple alpha carbon and purple carbonyl carbon. And that dihedral angle we're going to call phi. And so here is an example of a Newman projection we've drawn previously. Uh, and here is an image from that actual structure of this helical protein looking down the purple nitrogen to purple alpha carbon bond. And you can see that here is the bond between amide nitrogen and orange carbonyl carbon. And here is the bond between alpha carb, purple alpha carbon and purple carbonyl carbon. And in pink is the angle between those two lines. And uh, over here on the left is how we would draw that if we were drawing a Newman projection. In the case of this uh, amino acid in an alpha helix, this phi dihedral angle tends to be around minus 57, and that can vary plus or minus 5 to 10 degrees. But within alpha helices, most phi angles are around minus 57. There is a sign convention to determine whether the angle is positive or negative. I forget what it is, and I don't care that you know. Um, but I do want you to know the definition of this phi angle and have the idea that in certain secondary structures there are certain preferred values for that phi angle. And in fact, if that phi angle were much different than minus 57, this amino acid wouldn't be part of an alpha helix. All right. Um, oh, and one other feature, I guess, oops, that we wanted to talk about was that the dihedral angle can be influenced by the size of the R group or the side chain. Uh, in this case, our I position, I'm sorry, our I plus one amino acid has this large benzene ring side chain. And so the most stable confirmation about the nitrogen, purple nitrogen to purple alpha carbon bond is the one that keeps this biggest side chain anti in the back that R group side chain is anti to the gray bond in the front between uh, amide nitrogen and carbonyl carbon. And so we'll see that the side chain size can uh, influence the preference of this uh, amino acid to have a phi angle of minus 57 or something quite a bit different. 
Uh, now, if we move one bond down the amino acid and start thinking about the bond between alpha carbon and carbonyl carbon, uh, shown here in this close-up image of the I plus one amino acid in this alpha helical protein. Uh, we're looking down the bond between alpha carbon, purple alpha carbon, and purple carbonyl carbon. Our Sith eye is looking straight down that bond, and when we do so, we're going to be looking for the angle between the gray line in front between amid nitrogen and purple uh, alpha carbon, and then the gray line between purple carbonyl carbon and green amid nitrogen. And of course, that corresponds to this I plus two amino acid in the back. So here is what we see. Here is a drawing, and then here is an actual image from the structure of what we see when we look down that bond. Uh, between alpha carbon, purple alpha carbon, and purple carbonyl carbon. And of course, this is the I plus two amide nitrogen, and this is the purple amide nitrogen. And the angle between those two lines, uh, the two gray lines, the one in the front and the one in the back, is uh, the angle psi. It's the angle between the two carbonyl carbon to amide nitrogen bonds. And in most amino acids in alpha helices, that bond, I'm sorry, that dihedral angle psi tends to be around minus 47. Plus or minus 5 to 10 degrees is fine. But if it gets much further away than that, then the amino acid would no longer be in a, in a conformation consistent with making an alpha helix. All right, so the basic idea here is that the dihedral angles phi and psi determine whether or not the amino acid adopts an alpha helical structure or perhaps a beta sheet structure like we also saw last time in, in last time's lecture. All right, um, and you can study uh, protein structure uh, there are hundreds of thousands of protein structures in something called the protein data bank. And you can look at those protein structures and analyze all these dihedral angles. And if you do, you come up with, uh, you can actually plot them against each other. So if I created a plot, uh, we'll just make it kind of, roughly a square. And on this axis, we plotted phi angles. And on this axis, we plotted, plotted psi angles. In the middle here is 0. On this side is plus 180 degrees. On this side is minus 180 degrees. Um, then here in the middle is 0. Um, on this side is minus, on the bottom is minus 180 degrees, and at the top is plus 180 degrees. This kind of plot, and, and remember, each uh, amino acid in a peptide structure uh, can be described by two numbers, phi and psi, those two dihedral angles. So if we looked at this helix, if we looked at the purple amino acid within this helix, uh, what we saw for the purple amino acid was, let's see, let's make a little table. The um, I plus one amino acid, we saw that phi was around minus 57 and psi was around minus 47. And if we had made similar measurements for I and uh, the I plus two amino acids, we would have gotten uh, similar numbers. Let's just imagine that they were a little bit different, like minus 60 and minus 50. 
And then for the i position, let's say minus 55, minus 45. <clears throat> and then if we plotted these phi and psi values on this graph, we would see that uh, amino acids with similar phi psi values tend to cluster in similar areas of the plot. So let's say this is minus 60, this is minus 120, similarly this is minus 60 and minus 120. Um, and so the I plus, uh, I'm sorry, the I position amino acid we would expect to be somewhere around here. And nearby would be the I plus one amino acid. And nearby would be the I plus two amino acid. And if we measured these dihedral angles for all of the proteins in the protein data bank, for all the structures we have, we would start to see a huge cluster of phi psi angles in the vicinity of uh, minus 57 and minus 47. And maybe we'll just pretend that there was a lot of them here. And uh, those amino acids are in the alpha hill and we call this plot of phi and psi values for each amino acid in a peptide or protein structure the Ramachandran plot. And of course, so far, we've only plotted where amino acids in our alpha helix would show up. Um, and we've seen that uh, phi psi angles in the region of minus 57 to minus 47 here uh, tend to be uh, for amino acids in alpha helical conformations. Um, now, one of the interesting features of the alpha helical conformation, if you look at our I and I plus 1, uh, and I plus two residues in orange and purple and green respectively, is that the helix they form has uh, handedness. And helical handedness is defined by orienting the helix uh, from its amino or N terminus to its carboxylate or C terminus. In other words, can you see that here for the I position orange residue, here's the nitrogen, here's the alpha carbon, then swinging around in front is the carbonyl carbon, nitrogen, alpha carbon, carbonyl carbon, and so on. In other words, this chain has directionality. The uh, N or the, nit the amide nitrogen is towards the bottom of the chain in each case, whereas the carboxylate oxygen is toward the top, car carbonyl carbon is towards the top of each chain. So when you orient the helix in this direction from N to C, and you point your thumb towards the C terminus, and then you'll see that the fingers of your right hand will wrap around the helix in the direction of the helical twist. And we call this a right-handed alpha helix. And so having phi psi angles in this range of minus 57 and minus 47 is consistent with right-handed alpha helical structure. And of course, there are many other kinds of protein structures present in biological molecules. So here I'm showing you a Ramachandran plot uh, in which each dot represents the phi psi value for an amino acid uh, in a protein structure. And of course, uh, the alpha here represents uh, the portion of the Ramachandran plot that has phi psi angles in the range that's consistent with alpha helical secondary structure. 
Um, on the other hand, we have a dense area of phi psi values here, and the beta indicates that residues that adopt phi psi angles here tend to be in beta sheets and beta strands. Uh, there are other areas, for example, this one, and, and it's not important that we talk about what kinds of structures are formed by these, uh, <clears throat> by phi, amino acids with these phi psi angles. But uh, one of the interesting things you can see is that the Ramachandran plot is not uniform, uh, and, and the amino acids are not evenly distributed. That is, uh, the Ramachandran plot is biased towards phi angles that are negative, uh, and though uh, the psi angles can adopt positive or negative values. And presumably the reason for this has to do with the fact that our amino acids are chiral, they have stereocenters, and so um, certain conformations are preferred versus others. Um, if you look here, here is the region of the Ramachandran plot that has plus 57, plus 47, uh, and it turns out that if you have a phi psi angle of plus 57 and plus 47, you would make a left-handed alpha helix. And so uh, because of side chains, there's not that many amino acids that can adopt uh, this left-handed alpha helical conformation. There uh, are a few, and we could talk about them later. Um, I want to give you a sense for how the dihedral angles adopted by these amino acids depends on the structure of the amino acid side chain. Uh, by going to a web page that I've linked to in your chapter 26 study guide. And uh, this web page shows you an amino acid. This is alanine. And um, uh, we'll talk about the amino acid alanine. Uh, you've got here the alanine amide nitrogen, here the alpha carbon, the side chain, carbonyl carbon, and carbonyl oxygen, and then the next nitrogen. So this is what we would see if we were focusing in on this amino acid uh, uh, within an existing peptide chain. All right. Um, rotation around the bond in green is the phi dihedral angle. Rotation around that other bond in green is the psi dihedral angle. And um, and this animation allows us to rotate uh, about these bonds to change the dihedral angles and see what it does to the structure of the protein. Uh, I'm sorry, the structure of the amino acid. So let's go ahead and twist about the nitrogen to alpha carbon bond until we have uh, about minus 55. That's somewhat consistent with alpha helical structure. And then let's do the same for um, the psi angle. Let's get close to okay. That's maybe as close to alpha helical structure as we can get. Um, so in this diagram, our amino acid has phi angle of minus 55 and psi angle of minus 35. Um, and now we can click a button that shows us the potential for steric clashes uh, between side chains and backbone atoms in these various conformations. So one of the things you can see is that in the alpha helical conformation, there's not a lot of steric clashes, and that's great. Now let's see what would happen if we start changing some of these dihedral angles. All right. Uh, 
for example, our Ramachandran plot showed us that uh, amino acids in peptides and proteins tend to prefer negative values for phi. So let's see what happens if we start to increase phi from minus uh, 55 towards maybe positive 55. See what happens there. So notice the steric clash that's building up there. The uh, carbonyl oxygen from the previous residue is bumping up against the amide nitrogen from the following residue. And that gets worse and worse and worse. Okay, and I wish we could go in increments less than 20, but there you have it. <clears throat> Until uh, at that angle, the carbonyl oxygen is starting to bump into the amide proton and also to the side chain. Now let's see what would happen if we started to increase the psi angle. So if we try to get in a conformation that's similar to the left-handed alpha helical conformation with a, a, a phi of 50-ish and a psi of plus 47-ish, we start to see some steric clashes. And, uh, and the steric clashes involve the side chain. Now, if this side chain were uh, not at this position, but if it were at this other position on the alpha carbon, in other words, if we switched the stereochemistry of the alpha carbon, uh, we would relieve these steric clashes. Uh, the amino acid that's shown here with the side chain at this stereochemistry is called an L-amino acid, and the stereochemical configuration of that alpha carbon is S. If we were to change the stereochemical configuration to R by putting the methyl group right here, that would relieve the strain and make this left-handed alpha helical conformation more favorable than the right-handed. What I mean to communicate is that the reason so many amino acids show up here in the Ramachandran plot is because the stereocenter of the side chain in the amino acids in peptides and proteins has that L configuration. Uh, and if we switched it, we would expect to see similar regions for things composed of D-amino acids, but in sort of opposite quadrants. All right. So um, hopefully I've convinced you that the dihedral angles adopted by an amino acid are highly uh, influential in terms of the shape and structure of the peptide chain. Uh, and this is one of the ways, and, and uh, sorry, hopefully I've also shown you that uh, steric clashes between the side chain and the backbone can influence between backbone groups and between side chain groups can influence what conformations are allowed versus not allowed. And hopefully I've shown, oops. And uh, hopefully I've shown you ways in which that side chain uh, affects the allowed conformations in terms of steric clashes with it. So with that in mind, <clears throat> we want to uh, understand how the sequence of, or how rather how the composition of a side chain leads to um, specific secondary structures like alpha helices or sheets. And we will see that each amino acid has uh, its own 
preferred range of dihedral angles if you study the amino acids one by one. And so we're now going to introduce the names, the structures, uh, phi psi preferences, and where uh, appropriate PKAs for each of the 20 canonical or proteinogenic amino acids. And we'll tend to put them in groups. So first we have alanine. Its three letter code is ALA. Its one letter code is A. I want you to know both of those. Uh, I'm just going to draw the side chain structure here. So here is uh, an amino acid, and this is the R group. Okay, so in alanine, here's the squiggly line, here is the alpha carbon, and in alanine, what you have is a methyl group on the beta carbon. And um, If you look at alanine's phi psi dihedral angle preferences, you can see that it's happy in the alpha helical area, it's happy in the beta strand or beta sheet area. It's also happy in this other area, which uh, we won't talk about, but is related to polyproline type two helices of the kind that are found in, in collagen. Uh, one interesting feature of alanine is that it is fairly comfortable in both alpha helical and uh, beta strand types of uh, structures. It's also fairly comfortable uh, on the internal uh, area of proteins, but also along the protein surface. If we attach two methyl groups, to that beta carbon, we have the side chain valine, three letter code VAL, one letter code V. Here's the alpha carbon, here's the squiggly line, here's the beta carbon, and with valine, we have two methyl groups, and we would call them each gamma uh, methyl groups. Uh, and you can see that unlike alanine, uh, valine, well, like alanine, valine is comfortable in the alpha and the beta areas, but not in this uh, additional polyproline type 2 helical area. One of the, uh, we'll call valine a beta branched amino acid because uh, at the beta carbon, you've got a branching point with two different methyl groups. All right. Uh, next is the amino acid leucine, one letter code L, three letter code L-E-U. And the leucine side chain looks like this. So here's the alpha carbon, squiggly line, beta carbon. Uh, then we go to a gamma carbon, and then that gamma carbon has two uh, methyl groups attached to it, and we would call those both delta carbons. Uh, as you can see that um, leucine is similarly comfortable in alpha helical uh, context as is alanine, but leucine is also very comfortable in beta sheet and beta strand contexts. Uh, in fact, more so than alanine. If we look back up at alanine, the red here uh, color indicates in sort of intensity of observations. So where the color is red, that's where we observe more examples of dihedral angles in that, in that spot. And so we would see that there's more, uh, that leucine is perhaps more comfortable in beta um, strands than is uh, alanine. 
we have another amino acid that is structurally related to leucine. It's an isomer, a constitutional isomer. We will therefore call it isoleucine, one letter code I, three letter code I-L-E. Isoleucine is also beta branched. So here's the beta carbon. Here's one gamma methyl group. Here's another gamma CH2 group and a delta methyl group. And uh, as we said, isoleucine is also beta branched. Interestingly, the side chain has a stereocenter, and that stereocenter is always always has the configuration. Let's see, one, two, three, S. All right. Finally, uh, in our list of amino acids with relatively non-polar side chains, we have methionine, three-letter code M-E-T, one-letter code M, and uh, the structure of methionine is somewhat unusual. It's got an alpha carbon and a beta carbon and gamma, and attached to the gamma carbon is a sulfur, and then on the other side of the sulfur is a methyl group. So we've got an epsilon uh, methyl group, and the functional group here is called a thioether. Um, methionine is uh, encoded for by the start codon in, in uh, most organisms, and you'll learn about that in uh, later biochemistry classes. One interesting feature of methionine is that even though it's relatively nonpolar, it is easily oxidizable, such that if you leave it out in air, you can make it form methionine sulfoxide, which would be like this. which is now much more polar. Uh, if you work or have worked with Professor J.C. Price, you will know that looking for oxidized methionine residues is one of the ways you can uh, assess whether an amino acid is exposed to solvent or hid in the interior of a protein. Uh, there's nothing really that interesting about the dihedral angle preferences of methionine. It fits fairly well where uh, leucine and isoleucine might fit. And together, these amino acids that we've talked about so far are, these are our, our non-polar amino acids. So I don't know what a good color for non-polar is. Let's just maybe go green. Dare we try to color it all in? Why not? We like coloring. At least I do. You can fast forward through this part. Okay, so we'll call these our non-polar amino acids. Uh, the second group of amino acids are also uh, have the distinction of having uh, aromatic side chains. So the first one we'll talk about is phenylalanine. Uh, we're going to use 
the letter P for something else. So phenylalanine's one letter code is F because it makes the same sound. The three letter code for phenylalanine is PHE. And the side chain is just a benzene ring. It's just like alanine, except a benzene ring is attached to the beta carbon. And that side chain is, of course, aromatic. <clears throat> One of the interesting features of the aromatic side chain is that um, sp2 hybridized carbons are more electronegative than sp I'm sorry than are than our protons and so if we were to look at the at a benzene ring or any aromatic ring uh, in this case phenylalanine we would see that the pro oops <laughs> The protons around the periphery of the ring are electron poor. Uh, whereas the surface oops, of the ring would be relatively electron rich. So even though phenylalanine is nonpolar, uh, it can participate in some interesting non-covalent interactions because of the difference in electronegativity between sp2 hybridized carbons and uh, protons or sp3 hybridized carbons. All right. Uh, we can alter phenylalanine just a little bit by putting an OH group in the para position. This will give us the amino acid tyrosine, one letter code Y and uh, three letter code TYR. So here is the tyrosine ring. Um, one interesting feature of the tyrosine ring is that you've got this OH group on it, and the OH group is an acidic group. It's a phenolic OH group, and so its pKa is around 10. Um, so at physiological pH, you expect it to be protonated. Nevertheless, you would not be surprised in certain circumstances to find it find that oxygen to be somewhat nucleophilic. In terms of the dihedral angle preferences for phenylalanine and for tyrosine, there's not a lot to report. They are comfortable in both alpha and uh, alpha helical and beta strand type conformations. <clears throat> the third aromatic amino acid is tryptophan. And uh, its three letter code is TRP, but its one letter code is W. Not sure how you'll remember that. Um, I suppose you could imagine that you're young again and struggling to say your R's, in which case you would pronounce tryptophan to whip to fan with the W, and maybe that works. That's sort of how Elmer Fudd of Looney Tunes fame would pronounce it. Um, tryptophan is interesting because its side chain is aromatic, but it is more complicated than a simple benzene ring. <clears throat> so you have the alpha and the beta carbons. Then attached to the gamma carbon, well, hmm. sure, there we go. You have the alpha and the beta carbons. At the gamma carbon, you have a five-membered ring containing nitrogen and a double bond. And then attached on this side is a benzene ring. Oops. There we go. Um, this functional group 
in the uh, side chain of tryptophan is called an indole. And uh, again, the uh, face of the indole is electron rich, the edge is electron poor. And the other interesting feature of the indole is that you have this uh, proton. It's not particularly acidic, uh, but it can be a hydrogen bond donor. And actually, that was true for the phenolic OH group in tyrosine as well. Okay. So with that, we will have identified our aromatic amino acids. And maybe we'll shade them as well. Uh, we are only part of the way through the list of 20 amino acids, but I think we've come to a decent uh, stopping point for today's lecture. So let's pause there. Next time we'll talk about the remaining 20 amino acids. The remaining, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 amino acids. And then we'll start talking about peptide and protein synthesis and then finally the relationship between uh, structure, uh, sequence, and function.